Hello and welcome to Database Management Systems. I'm Jovita Christie, and in this video, I'm going to explain to you database security, a brief introduction to how modern databases are made secure. So let's begin. Modern databases use the following approaches to uh, make databases more secure. The first of these approaches is called discretionary access control or DAC. The second approach is called mandatory access control or MAC. And the third approach is called role-based access control or RBAC. Let's take a look at discretionary access control first, which is the most commonly used uh, security approach in modern databases. Here there is a user and the user is given access to different files and the user can access only those files which are allowed. So, and there are different types of accesses also, which we are going to see later, but this is the most commonly used approach because it's very fast and it does not provide a lot of security, but it's enough for our day-to-day -day usage. So this is the approach, a very simple approach where a user is given access to certain files and so he or she can access only those certain files. Let's see what are the different types of accesses which can be provided for discretionary access control. So the different access modes are, the first one is the simple read mode. So this is where the user can only read different things from the file. Then there's the write mode where the user can only write something into the file. And then we have the execute mode. So if you have a .exe file and you allow the user to have an execute access on that file, then the user can run that file. Then the user has the delete access mode. Delete access mode allows the user to delete the file if uh, he so wishes to do so. And then we have the null mode. The null mode means there is no access mode given. That means the user has no rights over that particular file. And then we have the control mode. This means the user can control that particular object or file completely. And finally, we have the control with passing ability. This means the user not only has control, complete control over the object, the user also has the uh, right to pass this control on to someone else. That is what control with passing ability means. Now, to handle all these modes, there are uh, different, different tables created, which are known as access control matrix, and we are going to see that now. So what you see here is called the access control matrix. The access control matrix actually shows you which user has access to which file and with what type of mode. So you can see some places it's written RW. RW means uh, read and write. Then there is uh, just C. C means control. Then there is CP. CP means control with passing ability. And that's how this type of a matrix is created. And you can see uh, on the left hand side, there are different types of users. Uh, those are the names of the users. And on the topmost uh, row, you can see different types of objects. These are different files available for access in the database. And you can see next to Kim over here, it is written uh, RW. So RW is written under Kim's file, which means Kim has a right to read and write into Kim's file. And this is how this type of a table is created. If you see MGR, which uh, stands for manager, which is right here, you can see that in this case, manager is having a CP on two files and then C on three files. So that means manager has control with passing ability on Kim's file and uh, Don's file and he has control over the remaining files. So this is how a discretionary access control mode works by creating access control matrix. Okay, now let's take a look at the mandatory access control. The mandatory access control works also on 
uh, the principles, the same principles of uh, discretionary access controls, but the access is given in a slightly different manner. Here, access is given not just on the basis of how users are associated with files, but also how files are associated with users. And you might have uh, watched some, if you have watched any crime fiction uh, series, you might know that you know some files are classified. So that means the person who wants to access the file does not have enough security clearance to be able to access that file. And that is why it is known as a classified file. So the same thing is available here in mandatory access control. A classification system where not only users are classified, but also files are classified. So each user is given a level and a file is given a level and only if the level matches, then the user is able to access the file. You can see here, users are divided into all these types of levels. So there's a level one user, level two user, level three user. And just like that, files are also divided into levels. So there's a level one file, two file, level three file. So only if the user is at level one, he can access all the files which are uh, from level one to three. And the same way if user is on level two, he can access every file on level two and below. So this is how mandatory access control works. And before I go to role-based access control, let me tell you when mandatory access control is used. Mandatory access control is used mostly in military applications uh, where um, you know, security is a priority, but it also slows up the process because there's so much security given that you need to match every user with every file. And that's why accessing those files is slightly slower than discretionary access control. Now let's go to role-based access control. Role-based access control is done in the same way as discretionary access control with very few differences. So first of all here, individual users are assigned to different roles. For example, a uh, user is, a, is an employee or user is a manager or user is a sub-manager or something of that sort. Then roles are also centrally managed by the administrator. So the database administrator decides which role to assign to which person. And then security groups are created for each role. So for example, if a person is just a simple uh, employee or a clerk, then there is a group of clerks created. And then this security group is given certain accesses to certain files. And as you can see, uh, each user is added to some particular security group. And also, this is known as non-discretionary access control because there is no discretion. Every user is, access, is allowed the same kind of access as the people that he or she is in a group with. So if you are grouped as a clerk, uh, then whatever access is given to all types of clerks is also given to you. So this in a way helps you because you don't have to um, you know, create a matrix where you have to add each and every user. You can just add each and every security group and you can assign files. You can decide which files can be accessed by a person in that particular security group. So this is how role-based access control works in DBMS. Although we have all these approaches for providing security, we cannot protect the system against malicious SQL commands because every user is allowed to write SQL commands. And while writing these commands, they might try to write a command in such a way that it harms the system. So in order to protect against such uh, activities, we use intrusion detection. So this is something that comes with your software, which is called intrusion detection. What intrusion detection does is, first of all, it logs all malicious activity in the database. So whenever it finds that some activity is happening, which shouldn't be happening, then it creates a log of such activities in the database 
and immediately notifies the administrator so that the administrator can um, you know, take some action uh, against this type of an activity. And intrusion detection could be uh, an external hardware or it could be also a software. It audits all the system files and configuration. So it doesn't just uh, take care of the database, but it also takes care of your operating system and all the files within your system in order to protect them against any uh, attack from the database. It also analyzes the attack patterns. So if there are, if there is a specific pattern of attacks, then these, this pattern is also analyzed by intrusion detection software or hardware. And it also monitors user and system activities. So not just users' activities are monitored, but also systems' activities are monitored in order to make sure that there is no malfunction or uh, behavior that is not common. There are different models of intrusion detection. The first one is called misuse detection. So this is the model where uh, the intrusion detection software or hardware uh, tries to check whether all the activities that are occurring are violating any of the system parameters. If any anything within the system, any of the rules are violated, then immediately intrusion detection would maybe sound an alarm or you know inform the administrator. The second type of uh, intrusion detection model is known as anomaly detection. So anomaly detection is where the intrusion detection software or hardware is constantly on the lookout for some sort of um, some sort of a behavior that is abnormal to the system. So whenever any type of behavior that is not normal or common or that usually happens is occurring, then immediately the intrusion detection system catches it and logs it into the system. Now next, uh, let's study SQL injection. SQL injection is one of the most common techniques of um, infecting the database. And let's see how what, what is an SQL injection and how it is done. Now, SQL injection is nothing but a code that is um, that that is injected into your database in order to destroy it. So that is what SQL injection is. It's nothing but a simple code that is passed into the database and that could um, affect or harm your database. It is also one of the most common web hacking techniques and it involves placement of a malicious code into SQL statements when you are filling, say, some uh, web forms or something. So when you're filling these types of forms, uh, there might be an SQL injection which, which is injected, and this could harm your system. Let's see uh, this with an example now. So consider this statement that is uh, given right here. You can see it. So here I have the text user ID equal to get request string. Now this is a uh, this is nothing but a PHP code, a very small PHP code. But what exactly it does is you don't need to really know how this other programming language works. You just need to understand that when there's a form involved on any kind of a web page then on that form you will see a user id uh, column or user id section where you enter your user id so this this particular line of code actually accepts that user id and then processes it so this is this is a code that is written in order to process a user id now this is my sql query so I have written select star from users where user ID is equal to. Now you can see that the variable I've used here is the same variable that I used here in order to get that particular um, user ID, which the user has entered into the form. Now, afterwards, just try to understand what if the user tries to enter 
this type of uh, uh, detail. Now you see the user ID entered is 105, but after that, there is a statement written which is or, and then it's written one equal to one. Now what happens exactly is this 105 or one equal to one, it gets stored in the text user ID. And then from the text user ID, it gets uh, stored in the SQL query, which is right here. So your SQL query that's going to run will look something like this, you can see. So it's going to be select star from users where user ID equal to 105 or one equal to one. Now, consider this for a minute, just for a moment, think about what this query can produce. First of all, we are trying to do select star. So that means we are going to get everything from our uh, table, which is users. And then the condition applied is user ID equal to 105. Now this 105, um, user ID equal to 105 may or may not match any of the rows. But the next condition given is or. So when I'm saying or one equal to one, one equal to one is always true. So whenever I enter this type of a condition that says one equal to one, then this query will always result in uh, giving me all the rows because one equal to one is true. It doesn't matter what row it is. So when, when we write it like this, then this query will produce all the rows of the user column, uh, of the user's uh, table. And now you might think that this is, that's okay. What, what difference does that make? But think of the user's table. What if it contains the user IDs and the passwords of all the users? then the person who has filled the form in this manner will be able to get access to this entire table of user IDs and passwords. And that is how um, hacking can be done. So SQL injection is one of the most common techniques of uh, performing hacking. And the uh, solution to this is not using uh, this type of a variable directly into an SQL statement, maybe you need to process it or something in order to process in the sense, maybe use some regular expressions uh, in order to make sure that this uh, user ID is actually a user ID and not some part of an SQL statement. That's the only way you can prevent um, any harm being done through the SQL injection. So that's it for this video. And I'll see you in the next one. Thank you for watching.